Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Kent, and I am going to present a little session on leveraging the interpretive mode, laying a foundation for the AP exam. I had the privilege of presenting this at the Northeast Conference in February, and um, I'm excited to be able to present it here to you folks on this virtual conference. So my goals for this session, um, really briefly, are to investigate the AP exam as an assessment target and to introduce a variety of multi-level things you can use at lots of different levels, interpretive mode strategies and activities that will help build proficiency that's needed for the AP exam. So really quickly, the College Board provides an assessment target. That's the AP exam. So if our ultimate end target is the AP, then we need to start thinking backwards from that. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the first half of the exam um, is 65 questions. And it's in nine different sets. And it's 50% of your total score. So half of the test, 50% of the test, or what you're being what you're being assessed on is, as you look here, reading and listening. The reading sections and the listening sections make up half of the test. So if you were listening to my title, the interpretive mode, you're catching on to what I mean here. This is the interpretive, reading and listening. The other, um, the other section of the test are free response questions, tasks, excuse me, and they make up the other 50% of the score. And they are based on interpersonal and presentational. Well, as you know, interpersonal, the interpersonal mode also requires listening and reading. And to be honest with you, the presentational mode also, especially in uh, the AP exam, where you, for example, are writing an argumentative essay, you have to read an article, listen to a listening selection and interpret a chart or a uh, infographic and then use those items to synthesize an argument that you write with. So it's very much influenced by your ability to interpret. Uh, same with the speaking and the speaking tasks. One of them you have to hear and respond and the other you have to be able to um, understand a prompt and be able to respond to that prompt. So uh, if you need more um, input about the um, the AP exam, I encourage you to maybe look that up yourself. I have a friend, his name is Gary DeBianca, and he is a rater for the AP exam. And he wrote a blog post about, I want to say about a year and a half ago, that um, targeted the idea of how much of the AP exam involves the interpretive mode. He did some research and looking through it, and, and we're talking of course, 50% of the test, which is listening and reading, but then also the prompts and the articles and the listening that you need to do the presentational activities. He came up with a staggering statistic that 67 to 87% of the AP exam involves the interpretive mode of communication. If the AP is one of our targets and we are trying to get to have students that are successful on the AP exam, what exactly should we be doing if 67 to 87% of the test is interpretive? Well, in my opinion, we should be doing interpretive activities with our students, lots of them, many, 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 starting at a very young level, um, at the lowest level that we can with our novice learners. Dr. Stephen Krashen um, has prepared seminal research in second language acquisition. And he also wrote The Natural Approach with Casey, Tracy Terrell. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Southern California, a linguist, an educational researcher, and an activist. And he has created something that maybe you've heard of called the Comprehensible Input Philosophy, or excuse me, the hypothesis. I want to say that the Comprehensible Input Hypothesis, many people consider it a strategy. I don't like to think of it as a strategy. I like to think of it as a philosophy or a belief system about how you feel or how you believe language acquisition occurs. So for Dr. Krashen, he said that the comprehensible input hypothesis answered the question, how does language acquisition occur? How do we actually acquire language? How does it get into our heads and into our long-term memories? Well, 
Here it is in a nutshell, the comprehensible input hypothesis by Krashen. It's heavily focused on the interpretive mode. It says that we acquire language. Acquire meaning it's in our long-term memory. It is a part of who we are. We can just access it whenever we want to. It's just right there. Spontaneous proficiency is really what we're talking about. We acquire proficient language when we understand what people tell us, we understand what we read, and we become absorbed in the message. So when we're hearing the language and understanding it, when we're reading the language and we're understanding it, and when we kind of forget that we're actually in the language, we're just so absorbed in the actual messages that we're listening to and reading that we're not thinking that we're in another language. We're not analyzing the language. We're not piecing it together. We're just communicating. This is the essence of the comprehensible input hypothesis. So reading and listening are the two things we're really going to talk about today. And I would just like to suggest that, unfortunately, reading right now is one of the most neglected areas in world language education. We just don't do it enough and we don't start soon enough. We really need to be starting to read with our students at very early ages. Um, or I shouldn't say ages, but at very early levels, at the novice level, they should be reading from the second day as much as possible. I'm gonna give you some strategies to do that. Oftentimes it's pushed to the upper levels instead of being incorporated into novice. And unfortunately, when you are trying to pass the AP test and the first time you ever read an article is in your AP level class, it's too late. You have not had enough background and you have not had enough experience with reading to be able to be successful on the AP exam. It's really a valuable skill and it's necessary for language acquisition. So here's some ideas. I want to first talk about the free, uh, the idea of free and voluntary reading. I don't know if you have ever heard of this before. We are uh, those of us that uh, this is a Krashen, Dr. Krashen idea as well. Um, it's where the idea that students can read what they want to read, and we're not forcing them to read anything. They just have a time when they can pick up a resource and skim it, read it, whatever they want to do. Free and voluntary reading, and. Um, I like to look at all sorts of things for students to have. Of course, infographics are a great thing for novice learners, but children's books with lots of pictures and articles, websites, novels. There's so many things that students can, can look at during free and voluntary reading. And it really gives them this powerful thing called choice. Students want choice. They want to be able to choose their learning. And even if they're making a bad quote unquote choice, that is going to become evident to the student at some point that they're not comprehending what they're reading or that they're only gathering certain ideas from their or certain words or vocabulary words from their reading. And then one thing that you can do in the classroom is even at a novice level, you can talk to your students about what they are reading. And there's a couple techniques for doing that. When you discuss reading with novices, one of the things that I like to ask very early on is, and, and help them to find in these, these resources that they have in my classroom library is who found a cogni. Really focusing on the idea of the cogni is going to really benefit them in the long run. If students are very accustomed to seeing and recognizing and, and really taking advantage of cognates in their reading, they're going to do a great, they're going to have a great um, foundation for the types of reading and the AP exam cognates, using all the things at their resources. Finding a word that they've already learned. Students can be asked, can you find a word that we've already learned? They can look through the things and pick out the vocabulary that they have in there. Maybe figuring out a new word. So if a student is looking at a picture book, they can look at a picture, look at the text, and try to negotiate the meaning between the picture and the text. And perhaps find a new word. They can also use the cognates. They can use the words that they've already learned and they can use words that they recognize and to create meaning and to figure out the meaning of other words. Sometimes you can have culture that pops up that you can have a chance to talk about and other times you can have some grammar that might pop up that you can look at. I think it's important to note that even from those early levels you can begin to ask these questions and have these little conversations with students in the target language. It doesn't take long until you can say, 
you know, qui a trouvé un mot qu'on a déjà appris. You can ask them who has found a word that we've already learned and who thinks they found a nouveau mot. And you can ask these things of the students and they begin to um, look for them immediately, but also begin to really analyze what they're reading and picking what they're reading and being able to have that right at their disposal for the words that they're coming up with. When you have advanced students, you can even embellish this a little bit more. You can um, have students read and then kind of report back to the class. Describe the main character, describe the main problem, what happens in the story. This also can become a discussion which then sort of becomes a listening activity in addition to a reading activity. Having them retell their stories in their own words, Sometimes a teacher can question an individual student about what's happening and expand to the class. Let's say, for example, the student's reading Garfield, um, and maybe they're an intermediate learner and they're reading Garfield, and you can start asking them questions about Garfield. And in this particular case, what is Garfield doing? Is this typical of Garfield's behavior? Is he always like this? Why is Garfield so mean? I mean, these are some things that you can discuss in the target language with the students regarding what they're reading in class. I think free and voluntary reading is very powerful. It teaches discovery, learning, and predicting, which are things that you definitely need when you are on the, when you're taking the AP exam. You have to learn some new things and you have to predict from what you're seeing. I think it also develops intuition in the language and you have a strong intuition. It encourages lifelong learning and encourages reading skills like the use of cognates and context. Context and cognates are so important for reading success on the AP exam. I think it also transfers skills into other contexts and maybe even transfers knowledge into other contexts. You can really learn things from books that you read and then use them in other situations. One of the things that I really like to do is use leveled reader, readers, whether that's from any of the um, independent and or uh, reader, leveled reader companies that are out there or the um, classics that we have um, that are abridged versions of classics. I like to use all of these in my classroom. I think that these leveled readers are a perfect link to reading more challenging authentic resources. I think one of the things that happens is we are trying really hard to only, when we try really hard to use only authentic resources in the classroom, I do think they're important and I think they're necessary because the AP uses authentic resources. However, when you're starting as a novice, you need something that bridges that gap between an infographic and an article. And you need fluent language that you can read and you can use to develop fluency. And so these leveled readers really provide that for us. They provide their tool that just really helps move students from um, just recognizing words to being able to learn to read more fluently. Um, I think that Krashen says that they they help students meet they meet the need of acquisition, and so students can use these level readers to acquire language and to get that repetitive language into their brains so that they become they have those words at their disposal when they need them. So things you can do with these leveled readers, I mean, you can do a lot of different things. But readers theater is always really popular, where students act out the narration with props, or you can assign characters and students read lines and translate late. Um, you can even use literature circles um, where you have students reading these different novels in small groups and um, responding to prompts that you might that you might um, provide for them. Um, it, th there really is a lot that you can do with these leveled readers and I really think that um, they're, they're becoming more and more well written these days and I think we just need to um, really embrace them and use them as the tool that they are to help students develop the proficiency that they need. Um, I think they also need to be reading articles and websites and to be investigating news and things like that. So providing graphic organizers that force students to come up with the main idea and the supporting details, these are really important. Um, I think sometimes one of the things that I like to do is when I'm going to use an article and I think there might be some vocabulary in the article that is challenging for the students, I try to highlight any new or really important words that they should know ahead of time. And then I give that to them. They take maybe three to five minutes to sort of 
look up these words and to have them. And then when we go to read it together as a class, we can do it more fluently and we can stay in the target language more effectively because the students have been able to look up the words that they that I figured that they would need at that time. I think it's really important when you're reading something, an article, a novel, a website, anything that you're using for class, that you always try to summarize the main idea or the main action, anything like that that's taking place. I think a lot of this could be done, especially with novice learners. It could be done in partners where you're where you're with the students and you're summarizing the main idea. Obviously, as students become more advanced in the language, these are things that they can do on their own um, without a partner. But I think using a partner to really bounce those ideas ideas off of would be a great way for students to summarize the main idea together. And I think it's really important to react to the test text. Ask students their opinions, their ideas. You know, you read something and you're like, do you agree with this? Do you not agree? What parts do you like about this article? What do you not like? And um, is this something you would consider? So notice how you can really use uh, the text as a backbone to do a lot of activities. So I try to read every single day with my students because it's so important. Um, reading impacts writing. Reading for pleasure is the source of most of our literacy. Krashen says this, and he says that form in writing, or what we call grammar, really comes from our reading. Anything that we gain and we learn how to do comes from the reading that we do. And so these are these are two of Krashen's ideas, but reading really impacts writing. They're very intricately linked. And the more that students read, the better writers they're going to be. And I think this is really true in their first language as well as in second language. Uh, my mentor, uh, Susan Gross, said that reading teaches language better than a teacher can. So it's so valuable, so important, and it's so necessary for success on the AP exam. The expected amount and type of reading on the AP exam really requires long-term exposure to reading and fluent reading practices. Hunt and peck, find the word. I mean, that, that works for a while, but eventually students have to begin to read fluently and they have to begin to really understand what they're reading. All right, moving on to listening the other half basically of the interpretive mode. And listening is really, really important. I think some of the problems that come with listening uh, right now in our world language classrooms is that many, much of what kids listen to, students I should say listen to, is can be incomprehensible to them. And that could be the teacher speaking incomprehensibly to the student. It could be the resources that we choose that are just too challenging for the students to understand. and. Um, it, it really isn't incomprehensible. So the question is, how do we make listening, especially authentic resources, how do we make them comprehensible? Sometimes there is no listening happening. Teachers aren't even speaking the language with their students, especially at those novice levels. They're focusing on more grammar points and things like that. And it's really not it's really not uh, acceptable. Students need to be hearing the language in order to acquire it and to develop proficiency in the language acquisition that they need, particularly for the AP test. So here's some ideas. Um, my ideas, as you can probably recognize, are very French heavy. I am a French teacher, so this is um, definitely something that is um, very near and dear to my heart. So these resources are very powerful. Um, but I wanna first talk to you about videos of high interest. Um, videos where they can, kind of like a picture book, where they can see an image and they can hear, just like they see an image in a picture book and they can read in a picture book. I think it's really important that in this very visual oriented society that these students are getting a chance to actually see and hear the the language. So I have two resources down here on the right. Um, if you're a French teacher and you've never heard of Un jour en actu, I know that um, uh, Rebecca Blue Wolf has made it very popular because she's uh, the world language, the actual uh, teacher of the year, and um, she happens to be a French teacher and uses these resources, but they are invaluable. They are such a blessing for us as French teachers to have. And if you haven't used the articles that are in there that are written at a great level for our intermediate students, and of course the video resources that are on there, you need to be using them. Uh, TV Saint Monde also has lots of interesting articles at various levels that you can use. But what I want you to do, because you can find plenty of things just on YouTube, 
that are interesting. I want to focus on what you do with these videos just for a few minutes. I really think that it's valuable to scaffold anything you're going to listen to by pre-teaching the vocabulary. There are plenty of ways to pre-teach vocabulary. People do it by just basically putting it up there on a list, asking kids, talking about it. They can kind of like what I did with the article. You can just make a list of highlighted words, have students look them up and then start talking about them. You can just interact, throw three or four words up on the board and then ask some personalized questions, getting kids to talk about the vocabulary that's up there before you listen to the resource. Or you can actually, um, you can tell a story, use those words in context in a different way. Plenty of ways to scaffold by pre-teaching the vocab. I encourage you when you are listening to a video or showing a video, or even just a listening uh, sample, that you do it multiple times, at least two, if not three times. I don't know about you, I'm not a native speaker, so sometimes when I'm listening to what the, the resources that come with my AP text, I need to listen to them two or three times to begin to understand all the nuances of what I'm hearing. And I know that students obviously need that too. So that repetition does help you to hear more and to understand more. And one of the big questions that I just like to answer, or excuse me, ask when after I've read a re or had a student listen to a resource for the first time is, well, what did you understand? And sometimes that dialogue has to take place in English, but the, the more advanced the student, the more you can do that in the target language. What did you understand? What did you pull out of there? What words did you hear? What ideas did you understand? And sometimes it's just by the pictures, but sometimes they can coordinate the sounds and the pictures at the same time. So I don't know if you've ever heard of movie talk. It's very, that's a strategy that's very popular these days where you freeze frame uh, during a video or a movie or a movie clip and then you talk about what's happening. Well, these videos, especially the Anjou and Actu videos, are perfect for that. You pause it and there's some sort of image and you can ask questions and you can interact it's really actually quite powerful to be able to do that and to maybe you can you can ask personal questions, you can ask opinion questions, you can say, does this happen in America? You can ask lots of questions like that using that technique. Another type of listening that you can do is the news, something that's simplified. Um, I know in French they have the, the Radio France Internationale, le journal, le journal en français facile. TV5 Monde has some things. Um, there's something called News. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's kind of spelled very strangely, N-I-O-U. News, it's ZZ, I think is the end of it. Um, but that's also a video made for kids and preteens that helps them to understand what's happening in the world. So you're getting the benefit of both current events, which are important to understand our world, but also simplified language. Once again, pre-teach vocabulary. Something I like to do that I think is important with listening is to discuss the topic first. So you discuss it with your students, or at least ask a couple questions that kind of get it started, then listen to the resource and then see what the students get because maybe some of the vocabulary that has come up in the discussion is something that can be used there. Once again, listen multiple times, not just once. The satisfaction that students will have by being able to comprehend more the second or third time is very important to them. This is where I just have to say, um, I like to talk about films, and I also like to talk about songs. And that's why if you're a French teacher, you see the picture of Stromae in the corner. And um, first I wanna talk about film for just a minute. I use film a lot in my upper level classes, particularly levels four, five, and AP. And every time I use them, I know what I might say could be controversial to you, but I really think it's important to always provide subtitles. At the, at the novice levels, you need to provide subtitles in English. And maybe at the upper levels, you can do French subtitles if you so choose. I actually always provide English subtitles as well because I noticed that I learn quite a bit from reading the subtitles and absorbing what I'm hearing. And I think film is very important. The minute that my students don't understand, the minute that they stop comprehending what's taking place, they're disengaged and they no longer want to participate in what we're doing in the classroom. So I think providing subtitles is important. I think it's really important to discuss the films. So not just 
watch them, although there's probably value in and of itself, but then to expand on that, the teacher posing great questions, getting the kids to remember what happened, restate what happened, understand the significance that's happening in the film or what a particular line meant. Discussing film is a fabulous way for students to get some great listening or interpretive mode practice. I think songs are really powerful and super fun and the kids can begin to sing them and to really have this uh, versatility or I should say this agility with the with with the language that they didn't know they had because they are singing it. I always try to provide the lyrics to that and then I want to discuss the lyrics with my students and or maybe the video that corresponds with the song um, with the lyrics and see if the lyrics in the video kind of jive. Do they go together or are they completely different? I also think that uh, close activities are very appropriate where they have to kind of hear and understand. I, I try really hard to pick the words that I think that they're really going to get for the close activities. I always try to make them words that they already know or cognates, things that they can readily understand and spell, because that's always a challenge for students as well. Um, I just would like to say I, that I could probably teach all of the AP themes with Stromae songs. Um, if you're a French teacher and you know Stromae, you are probably would agree with me that his songs are so valuable for what we do in the classroom. So one aspect of listening that I think we overlook is just that daily interaction, class discussion with the teacher. And that looks different at different levels, but even at that very early age, I remember teaching seventh grade and having a discussion in the target language with my students about um, a, like a movie that they saw recently. And it led us to, I think it was like the movie, The Giver, The Maze Runner. They all kind of were these post-apocalyptic um, divergent movies that we, that the students were comparing the fact that they were books and movies we in our in our conversation together as a class that came up so i took a poll of the class like who's read the book who saw the movie which is better these are all questions that i generated with my students once again providing them with comprehensible input but they were a part of it and they were engaging and allowing the conversation to continue these are important I think these encourage the spontaneity that you need for the AP exam. The one task, the interpersonal speaking task that you need on the AP exam, you have to have spontaneous language. You have to immediately hear something, hear something and then immediately respond to it. And if you can't do that, you can't, you cannot, if you can't comprehend and then have something to say, you need to think about it, plan it, read it. It's not going to work. You have to have spontaneity and they need to practice that. And the best way for students to practice that is through class discussions with their teacher. It practices that give and take of what interpersonal communication truly is. And having those kinds of interactions are important. Uh, just a little side note, and um, I've had the privilege of having some students who chose to go to uh, study abroad their junior year and of high school, and then to come back as a senior and take the AP class with me. And sometimes I've even had French exchange students who've from France who've come and stayed, been in my classroom as a heritage speaker. And it's been really powerful for me to have fast-paced interactions with those students and to have my other students listen. And I want to caution you here that a lot of times we focus on the student output, whether we focus on the quality or the quantity of the student output. I really want to, to harness the comprehensible input hypothesis and say that we acquire language when we understand, not speak, we acquire language when we read and understand, not write. The acquisition of the language is happening when we're reading and we're listening. And so the students really need the teacher, you, to do most of the talking, describing, and mediating of the conversation in order for them to acquire language. It's really important that we don't focus too much on the output and really focus on the input because Bill Van Patten says that acquisition cannot happen in the absence of input. We have to have input in order to acquire language. And lastly, I just want to say to you, if you're nervous because you're not a native speaker about your abilities in the language, 
you really have to come to grips with the fact that you can't focus too much on your own errors in the language. Just keep engaging your students in meaningful dialogue. Keep finding ways for you to improve yourself, but really, you they need you and they need your language ability and they need that interaction with you to be successful on the AP exam. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a privilege to be with you. Good luck in all of your endeavors and I wish you all the best.